Welcome to Physics 4B, the second semester in a uh, sequence of physics for scientists and engineers. Before we get too far into the semester, I should take a moment and introduce myself. That's me right there. A little something about me. Uh, I'm about 78 kilograms. My mass is approximately 78 kilograms. So that means on Earth, my weight, which can be found by multiplying my mass times the strength of the Earth's gravitational field, is approximately 766 newtons. But what the heck is a newton? Okay, hopefully you recall that one newton is the same thing as one kilogram meter second to the negative two, or we could say kilogram meter per second squared. Now, likewise, I could ask, what's a watt? What's a joule? What's a pascal? The answer to all these questions is some arrangement of kilograms, meters, and seconds. The metric system is sometimes referred to as the MKS system. Meters are the fundamental unit for length or distance. Kilograms are the fundamental unit for mass. And seconds are the fundamental unit for time. For us to proceed in this course, we need another fundamental unit. The fourth fundamental unit is the amp, which is short for ampere. We can use the fundamental unit of the amp, which is the fundamental unit for electric current, by the way. We can use that fundamental unit to create other derived units. For example, we can combine seconds with amps to get a unit for electric charge. It turns out that one coulomb is equal to one amp multiplied by one second. We're going to start this semester by talking about uh, coulombs um, in great detail. So coulomb is the unit for electric charge. And we can express, um, well, a couple of particles you should be familiar with in terms of their electric charge. Uh, first of all, let me show you what a bad model for an atom looks like. That's the one on the left. And here's a better, better uh, model of the atom on the right. Okay, so um, instead of saying that the electron exists in a well-defined orbit about the nucleus, we'll mention the electron as one of the fundamental particles we want to discuss and say that its location is in um, a cloud as opposed to a well-defined orbit. I'd like to tell you the mass of the electron before I tell you about its charge. Uh, quick side note, if you'll indulge me. So I think this is an urban myth, but I've heard the story of somebody who bit into a small razor blade uh, and a piece of candy that was passed out on Halloween. If that were true, I'd suppose that person would want to immediately call 911, right? And because this was passed out on Halloween, it's worth remembering that date. Let's see, Halloween is October 31st, right? So we can say on 1031. And this would be a very negative experience if that were to happen. So 9.11 times 10 to the negative 31st, turns out that's the mass of the electron in kilograms. I know that really has nothing to do with electricity and magnetism, but if that helps you remember this numerical value, great. The mass of the electron is 9.11 times 10 to the negative 31st kilogram. The charge of the electron is expressed in coulombs as negative 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19th coulombs, sometimes just referred to as negative 1, lowercase e. The proton is located, of course, in the nucleus, figure not drawn to scale. Its mass is about 2,000 times as great as that of the electron. It's 
times 10 to the negative 27th kilogram. And its charge is the same magnitude as the electron, just opposite in sign. So positive 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19th coulombs, or we can say positive 1, lowercase e. The neutron is also located in the nucleus. Its mass is pretty much the same as the proton. Uh, not quite, slightly more massive, but to three sig figs, it's the same value. And of course, it carries zero charge. This semester is largely going to be the story of the electron, or um, maybe more so how the electron behaves. We'll investigate the forces that charged objects exert on one another. I referenced an equation at the beginning of this lesson that says I can find weight by multiplying mass times gravitational field. Uh, weight, we can say, is the same thing as force. Well, there's a very similar equation for electric charges. If you want to find the force on an electric charge, you need to multiply not so much its mass, but its amount of electric charge. Now, the symbol we use for electric charge in an equation uh, is Q. And multiplying an amount of charge times a gravitational field won't solve for anything. Uh, here, let me erase all this. Now, the similar equation to finding gravitational force by multiplying a mass times a gravitational field is we can find an electrostatic force by multiplying a charge times an electric field. Now, sometimes um, the gravitational field is not like it is here on Earth, where we just always plug in the same numerical value of 9.8 newtons per kilogram, regardless of the value of mass, right? In other words, sometimes gravitational fields aren't uniform. Uh, if we wanted to find the gravitational force between the Earth and some satellite that orbits around the Earth, we can't use this equation. We have to use the more fundamental form of uh, Newton's law of universal gravitation and say the mass of the Earth is m1, the mass of the satellite is m2, and as long as we know the distance r from center to center between the two of them, then the force is equal to the mass of the planet multiplied by the mass of the satellite divided by the distance between the two squared. Of course, we need the uh, um, universal constant. That's just to find the magnitude. If I wanted to express this as a vector equation, I guess the radial vector is just a line that points straight out from the center of the attractor uh, off toward infinity. If I make a vector that's exactly one unit long, along that line, I have the unit vector r hat. So we can say that the force of gravity is equal to, I guess it's negative g m1 m2 over r squared multiplied by r hat. So by multiplying times a unit vector, Unit vectors, by definition, have a magnitude of 1, so I'm not changing the magnitude of the whole answer, but I'm giving a direction to that quantity. And the negative sign means it's directed, right, the force on this mass number 2 is directed back toward the center. Okay, well, likewise, if I had one charged object, maybe I call that Q1, and a second charged object, Q number 2, and they're separated by a distance of r, then I can find the force. Just in terms of magnitude, the force is found by multiplying the charge of one object times the charge of the second one divided by the distance between the two of them squared. Looking familiar yet? And of course, I need to multiply this times a fundamental constant. If I want to make this a vector equation, then I can create a vector I call r hat. And say the force is equal to k, q1, Q2 over R squared multiplied by R hat. In this case, there isn't a negative sign. It's positive because if charge 1 is positive and charge 2 is positive, if both of these values are positive, the force is not a force of attraction. It's going to be a force of repulsion. Anyway, there's a strong similarity we can see between 
this law for electrostatic force compared to Newton's law of universal gravitation. And that word Coulomb comes up once again. This is known as Coulomb's law. So largely, we're going to spend this first uh, chapter, the first unit of study, on forces exerted between charged objects. Sometimes we'll be able to use Coulomb's law to find the force between discrete particles, like this example. In other cases, we're going to have to come up with a different method for determining an electric field strength, and we'll revert to this formula for finding electric force. But this should be familiar. Uh, in your first semester study, sometimes we had to use Newton's law to find gravitational force. Sometimes we were able to revert to this form of the equation in the case where gravitational fields were uniform. So there's a preview of things to come. Um, for now, thanks for watching.